Good morning. Um, thank you so much, uh, brothers and sisters and the families, for coming that we may rejoice together in the glories of Christ. Uh, even as we um, continue with our journey through the book of Colossians, uh, please then humbly turn with me into the copies of God's Word in the book of Colossians, chapter number two. Um, that um, we have been considering for the uh, first uh, for the past couple of uh, uh, weeks, Colossians chapter number two, verses um, six through fifteen. This passage of scripture has been quite um, helpful to us. The apostle Paul has demonstrated clearly that. Uh, we did receive Christ Jesus in verse number six, and he's calling him the Lord, and he therefore calls upon the believers uh, gathering at Colossae and Laodicea and all those who have not seen his face to walk in him, the Lord Jesus Christ having received him, to be rooted in him and built up in him and to be established in the faith just as they were taught and abounding in thanksgiving. And therefore, having encouraged them and asked them and uh, exhorted them to do so, the apostle embarks on a journey in verse number eight to show them that outside there, there are vultures, ravenous vultures that are there to destroy the beautiful salvation that they have in the Lord Jesus Christ and that uh, they are called uh, false teachers who would peddle a philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirit of the world, and not according to Christ. And the apostle then fortifies the faith of the believers by uh, reminding them of the glories of Christ Jesus, the benefits they have in him, the fullness they enjoy in him in verse number 10. It tells them that you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. And in verse number 11, down through 15, the apostle begins to explain the fullness they enjoy in Christ Jesus. And we saw last Sunday, in verse number 11 and 12, that uh, in Christ Jesus, the believers were circumcised with a circumcision made without human hands. But this is a circumcision that was uh, performed by Christ Jesus. This is a circumcision that involves the putting off the body of the flesh, the sinful nature. And he goes ahead to tell them that uh, in verse number 12, they have been buried with Christ Jesus in baptism, and that they have also been raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised Christ Jesus from the dead. That they have enjoyed these blessings, participating in the death and burial and resurrection of Christ Jesus and, Jesus and being circumcised by the very Christ Jesus that uh, has saved them. And so today, we shall focus on verse number 13, uh, the part A of it, which is um, a continuation of verses 11 and 12. In this particular portion of God's word, the apostle says, he tells them, it's a direct uh, you know, um, um, communication that he, he, he makes unto them, he tells them, and you, he calling the attention, you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, that is Christ Jesus, having forgiven us, all our trespasses. I want us to focus on that part, the, the first portion of it, part A of verse 13, that reads, and you who are dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him. That's the portion I want us to look at. Then next Sunday, the Lord willing, giving us grace and life, we shall begin to look at the forgiveness of our trespasses Part uh, 13b, following uh, through to part 15 of the, of the portion of scripture. So then, in this section of the letter, the apostle is going to, again, having explained in verse number 11, the symbol of their salvation, the symbol of circumcision, in verse 12, the symbol is that of baptism. The apostle Paul is going to use another graphic language in verse 13 of death. Now, there are so many ways of describing our spiritual condition before salvation. 
The Bible explains in so many ways. Sometimes the Bible explains uh, our wretchedness, our spiritual condition before conversion as those who are lost, lost sheep and sheep that have gone astray, sheep that are hopeless, no hope of returning home until the shepherd has to go and find them and bring them home. And so we see that when the Lord says, having conversed with Zacchaeus, tells them the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. And that is what he does. Because we are lost in our sins, we are lost to the extent that we can't come back home ourselves. The shepherd has to go for the sheep. He has to go looking out for them. He has to bring them home. It's the picture of salvation, the lostness in sin, the wretched spiritual condition, the vileness of sin is described as those who are lost, the lost sheep. Yet another way through which the Bible explains and describes our lost condition, our lostness in sin, is that of being heavy laden with Luggages on our backs, the picture given that we are people who need rest. And so the Lord would invite then us who are wretched that we come unto him, we who labor and are heavy laden, that he may give us rest. People who are under the weight of sin, people who are under the guilt of sin, people who apart from Christ and his work cannot lift off the weight of the shoulders. Someone who is carrying a heavy luggage, luggage on him. Someone who needs rest. He is weary, is the language that is employed in uh, the Gospels. Another way through which our lostness and sin is described in scriptures is that of slavery. That we are slaves to sin. We are slaves to our sinful natures. That apart from Christ rescuing us, apart from Christ delivering us from that slavery, we are, bondage. we are in bondage. We are lost in that bondage. No way of coming back. Think of, you know, uh, you know um, people who have been arrested, people who have been captured or captives of war. When Kenya is fighting in Somalia and, uh, you know, we have been taken capti into captivity by the enemies. And so we need a stronger force of the nation. We need a stronger force back at home to go for us and bring us back home. Because in and of ourselves, we can't get off the hook of slavery. It's another picture through which our salvation is described in describing our spiritual condition. But in this particular passage of scripture, the Apostle Paul is describing our lostness in sin as death. We are dead in sin. Dead in trespasses is the language of the text. And so he's showing us again another picture that our wretchedness, our depravity, our vileness in sin is such that it can be described as death. Such horrible description, such graphic description. This is what can describe, can capture what we are and who we are apart from the saving grace of Christ God himself coming to us. So this is what I want us to look at. That we are so vile, we are so dead in trespasses and sins that we require resurrection is the language. And so it says that you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with Christ. Life is what is required because there's death. Death does not require medicine. We don't administer medicine when someone is dead. They won't come back to life. When you go to the mortuary and you apply medicine to the dead, lying there, lifeless, they won't come back to life. They don't even need medicine, they need resurrection, is the emphasis, just to show you of the vileness and the depravity, the decadence and the rottenness, the corruption of human soul, beyond repair. This is the language of the text here. So, he's going to explain to us, first of all, our depravity by showing us that we are ruined by sin. But in the second place, it's going to uh, lift our hearts that we who are ruined by sin, we have now been raised by God. And that will be the basis of our joy. We'll be so happy this morning we saw one of the uh, you know, things that would evoke our 
joy is salvation. We marvel at our salvation because we who are ruined by sin, wretched, have been saved graciously by God. Let's look at them in the first place, how we are ruined by sin before we are saved. The Apostle Paul says, and you, talking to Christians, not just any other person, these are believers he's talking to, he's writing to, and you Christians, you believers, you are dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. You are dead. This is a past tense. This is something that describes your previous condition in sin, is the Apostle Paul's um, message here. is showing us our vileness before grace found us. We didn't find ourselves. Grace did because we are lost to the point of no returning back. And he says in verse number 13 that you who are dead in your trespasses, the language of the text, not just sins. There's a slight difference because trespasses is a way of describing sin. But when he uses the language of trespasses or transgression, a trespass is, you know, to overstep, you know, or sidestep your, your boundaries, to overlap or to overstep, overstep your boundaries, your set boundaries, to encroach. If you have been found as a trespasser, you have encroached into unwanted and lawful territory. Is what he's saying here. This is what describes us. Not just sin wholesomely so that we don't miss the point, so that we miss the point, it is sin, but sin described as a trespass. Going or encroaching into a territory that is unlawful. Like a your son encroaching into your neighbor's mango orchard and picking mangoes unlawfully. And you know the consequence, the, the neighbor would come for your son and will have questions to answer why your son encroached. It's a trespass. That is a language of rebellion, a language of disobedience. You know that this is unlawful, this is a marked place, it's a, it's a place out of bounds. But you encroach, like this boy who is going to the neighbor's farm to pick the mangoes, is the language of the text. That is how we are described. Not just sinners, but disobedient sinners, rebellious sinners, who have gone where God has put a boundary, and we go beyond the boundaries of God. We go beyond the boundaries. Think of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. They were told that they would be allowed to eat certain fruits in the garden. They are not banished from eating all the fruits in the garden. But God said, God specified that this, this particular a tree from which you should not eat. But that's exactly what they did. And so, in Romans chapter number 5, the language of sin there is a language of transgression and trespass. You look at it there. Because then, they, how did they break God's commandment? By encroaching into some place that was forbidden. Is what makes it wretched here. So bad, because we are trespassers, we are transgressors, not just mere sinners. In other words, it's an active form of sin. That's the point. We are not passive. You know, we can say that because of Adam, we are sinners. Original sin, that's okay. But when the Bible says we trespassed or we transgressed, we are inactively involved in it. We did it. It's the difference here. The postal policy. But it says... Not only were we transgressors or trespassers, but we were dead in that particular condition. Meaning, we reached a point of no returning back. That's the way in which we were rebellious. That's the way in which we were disobedient, that we can't come back. A point of no return. Remember what the Lord says in the book of Genesis chapter number 6 verse 5. He looks at humanity and he says that humanity was so depraved to the point that the inclination of the humanity was only evil in their hearts continually. Then, in other words, it's like saying they didn't have any break. They couldn't break someone who is at high speed. He is going headlong at a high speed without brakes. He's not coming back. That is what describes our condition. Dead, 
to the point where you can't come back. And this is what the Apostle Paul is describing here for us. And I've told you that this is what describes the condition of our heart before we converted. Sin ruined our hearts to the point that the heart does not require medication. We have surgeons here. We have Emmanuel is a surgeon. And he understands these things. You know, we can have a heart condition that requires medication. You simply need medication and the heart gets better. You go to the hospital, the cardiologist will tell you that what I need to do is administer some medication in your heart and the heart will recover. It has some problems that can be corrected that you require medication. Our hearts don't require recovery. They have reached a point of no return back, no, no coming back. We could even say that our hearts did not suffer from cardiac arrest. Because you know, if you suffer from cardiac arrest, you can be resuscitated, CPR. The heart can be revised, you know, revived. These doctors will perform some operation on you so that you come back to life, you have suffered a cardiac arrest. That is not how we are described. Not sick in our hearts, not suffering from cardiac arrest in our hearts that we require resuscitation, we require a transplant. The heart has reached a point that it cannot function. And so we require life. God must undertake a surgery in our hearts to give us new hearts is how salvation is described. The heart is dead. It's described as a heart of stone. It has to be removed and a new heart of flesh has to be put in. It's a very graphic way of showing how wretched we are. Sometimes we underrate ourselves. We underestimate our depravity. That's what the God of the Bible says. That we, the heart that we had required not recovery, not resuscitation, but resurrection. Dead. Dead in sin. Dead in trespasses. It shows this clearly. The Apostle Paul shows this clearly. For example, in chapter number 1. Look at the end of verse number 21. To show you that this is serious. He says again, the language, and you, in verse number 21 of chapter 1. And you, Christians, who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. This is who the, Corinth, uh, the, the Colossians were before grace found them. They were alienated. They were separated from the life of God. They were separated from God and his blessings. They were separated from communicating on communion with God. And not just that alone. They were hostile in mind. Enmity was their characteristic and the point that morally speaking they were doing evil deeds. This is human depravity, both spiritual and moral. So serious. To the point of no return is where we arrived at. That because of this, the Apostle Paul says in verse number 21 and 22, we need reconciliation. Nothing can you know, rectify the situation. It's a bad situation that requires um, reconciliation. Something has to be done. In chapter number three, the Apostle Paul again described our depravity in this particular letter. In, number, in verse number five, he will say, again talking to Christians, put to death therefore what is earthly in you, and he names them sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is adultery. On account of this, the wrath of God is coming. Now, watch verse 7. In this, this uh, are two things, you too once walked when you're living in them. This is the life that the Christians lived before they were converted. And the Corinthians and the Colossians in this case are not different. It says the same thing about the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians 6. He describes to Timothy in Timothy, Timothy chapter 2 that the same thing can be said about Christians. That the Christians, before they were converted, before grace found them, they were so wretched. 
that should inform them how we approach God of salvation. That should inform how we approach salvation. We saw in the morning that if you recognize, if you consider yourself as such wretched, then when you consider the beauty of salvation, the grandeur of it, then it invokes joy. That I lost, not just lost, a slave, not just a slave, I, individual who was, was under the heavy laden of sin, not just heavy laden, I was dead. But God powerfully raised me from that condition, is the description of the Apostle Paul here. He calls our attention to our radical depravity, to our separation from God and our moral corruption. This is what we are. It is a problem of the heart. This heart he will tell us later on that it requires resusc not resuscitation, not recovery, but resurrection. Then look at then the joy that comes. This kind of depravity the Apostle Paul describes in here, in this particular passage of scripture, is such that we are spiritually helpless. Someone who is dead is helpless and hopeless. How is, it help how is this individual helpless? Because he is totally unable to respond to any stimuli. A dead person cannot respond. You play music, you go to the graveside, you go to the coffin side, and you do all sorts of rituals that we usually do before we bury. They have nothing to do with it. It is our ritual. We are enjoying ourselves in that party. They have nothing to do with it. Whatever you say in that funeral doesn't concern them. That's what happens. They can't respond. They won't eat. They won't walk. They won't hear. They won't open their eyes. They're dead. It's a helplessness, spiritual helplessness that we have. That we, in our lostness, we cannot hear God. Our ears, like a dead person, cannot hear God. That we, in our lostness, cannot see God. Because like dead people, we can't open our eyes to see God. That we, like the dead people, cannot come to God. Because our legs are dead. And so the Bible will tell us, when Christ is speaking gloriously, that no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. He has no legs. And even if he has legs, they are dead in sin. Dead people don't walk. It's the description of our sinfulness. We can't hear God. We can't see God. We can't come to God. Our minds are dead. The brain has melted in the coffin. And so the Bible says, no one can understand the things of God. This is the depravity of man. You think he, probably you've never pondered over these things. It's so bad that we can't understand. Our brains doesn't function. It's dead. That we can't please God. We don't have a heart to please God in the coffin of sin. We can't obey God in that coffin of sin. So, bad as state is our spiritual helplessness. There's nothing we can do. We can't respond to any spiritual stimuli. We want to hear him. We want to see him. We want to come to him. We want to understand. We want to please him. We want to obey him. Is our description. But this leads to something else. Our spiritual hopelessness. We are first of all spiritually helpless. And then we are spiritually hopeless. What hope does a dead man have? You know, this is the point. If you are sick, your heart has a problem, you can go to a cardiologist and they can treat your heart. They can prescribe medication. They can correct the problem. Because you're still alive. There's still happiness and joy. There's still some hope when you have suffered cardiac arrest. Because the CPR can be conducted on you. They can still resuscitate you. But what hope do you have when someone's dead? You will walk through the corridors of the hospital, the theater, and the doctor will meet you, having lost your dead one, your, your loved one, and tell you, we are sorry, there's nothing you can do. We tried all that we could do, and we have lost him. In other words, there's hope. At that point, you crash in the arms of the one with, with whom you came. You've lost hope. What hope is then is there when someone is dead? You have hope, you're hopeful when they're still in ICU, HDU, because perhaps they can come back to life. 
you still hopeful you can still pray, you can still hold up a prayer meeting here to pray for them that are well and well, even to the point of being in a CIP, in a ICU or a HDU. But the moment you are told that they are dead, we even stop praying. Hope is gone. Remember Jairus. Jairus comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jairus tells him, the Lord, Master, my daughter is at the point of death. She's very sick. Please come and heal my daughter. And then the Lord is intercepted by a, a crowd. And in this crowd, there's this woman suffering from hemorrhage. You know, and she, you know, touches the garment of Christ and she's healed. And in that commotion, report comes from home. Hope Jairus is home. And the workers come and tell him, Master, you don't need to bother the master. There's no need of calling him home. Why? Your daughter is dead. I mean, there's nothing the mother is going to do. The master should not come home. She's already dead. We had hope when she was still alive. But now that she's dead, the master doesn't have to come with us. Hope has been lost. It's our description. Friends, this is our, who we are. People who are hopeless. We were hopeless like that in our lostness of sin. But thank God for the grace. We need to be regenerated to new life, which is the second point. We who are dead in our trespasses and the uncircumcision of our flesh, that is regener and regeneration, we were unregenerate. We were not members of God's covenant community, separated from him. The Bible says God made us alive together with Christ, which is the ruin in sin, but the joy is raised by God, which is our next point, second point. Now, there are three things that we location this resurrection that I want us to look at gloriously. That God raised us, God made us alive, is something that he did sovereignly. He raised us sovereignly, he raised us powerfully, and he raised us with Christ. Let's see how then God raised us sovereignly. The Bible says, and you who are dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive. It is God who did it, is the point. I, I, I will help you appreciate this in Ephesians so that you see. The Apostle Paul will make the same emphasis in Ephesians chapter number 2. So that you see that it is God who made us alive. We didn't cooperate with God. Dead people can't cooperate. In the morgue, dead people are simply operated upon. They can't cooperate. We can't cooperate with God in salvation. We can't. We are dead. Is the point here? He did so sovereignly. This is a monogistic work. Salvation is monogistic because it involves those who are dead, not those who are still breathing. Ephesians chapter number two. The apostle says again the same language. And you who are dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of your flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and are by nature children of wrath, the dreadfulness of this, like the rest of mankind, condemned to the point of hell, was our place. The bad news of it. Because of our lostness in sin, our depravity and corruption and decadence, our place was hell. By nature, children of wrath, like everyone else. The Christians were not different from anyone else. They were also faced the same challenge of lostness and therefore condemnation. Look at verse 4, so glorious. The Apostle Paul says, but God... Then there's that this everything turns around. This hope there in verse number four, because God is the hope there, but God. What did God do? God being rich in mercy, not because of us, God because of the great love with which he has loved us, not because we loved him. Even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. This is the joy of salvation. God sovereignly made us alive together with Christ Jesus. 
powerful, such a good news that we are seeing, re reading from this passage of scripture, because God is full in mercy, he's rich in mercy, because he has great love for us. He did this. Not even a single one of us cooperated with God. It was sovereignly done. This is a monogistic work. God alone saved us through the work and the person of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what makes salvation glorious, friends. That there's hope that the God that has saved us is rich in mercy, is full of love, is glorious in love. He looks at us like he, he communicates with Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter number 37 and he tells him, son of man, please lift your eyes and see in that valley of dry bones. What can you see? And I see dry bones and he tells them, can this dry bones live? And Ezekiel turns to God and tells him, Lord Yahweh, only you know what that can live. He tells them, prophesy the four winds, the four corners. Prophesy that they may live because they are dead. And then the sinews and the tendrons come and the flesh and the bones are rattling together and they are coming, they join together. The bone of the knee comes, the bone of the head comes because the bones were disintegrated when they died. You know, have you seen someone who, who died a long time ago and the, the, you know, the archaeologists are excavating? The bones are separate, the head is different, separate, the hands are separate, and, they, and everywhere, every part of the body is separate. The flesh is not there. The tendons are not there. And God tells him, prophesy that they may live again. And Ezekiel having prophesied, he sees the fair mom coming. He sees this, you know, the skull coming. He sees the arms and every part of the bones coming together. And he's amazed they are becoming alive. Look at the flesh is covering them. And he tells them, and, and it goes to God and tells them, it tells God, God, you see now it has been formed. Their bodies have been formed, but there's a problem. They're still lying on the ground. The Lord tell him, the blow, I'll breathe into their nostrils. The same way I did at the time of creation when Adam was lying here, they are lifeless. It's the same way I will blow my life in them and God blows his life in them so powerfully that they rise from the dead and they walk as a big army is the description of our salvation that is how serious it is raised powerfully by God is the second point to talk about Do you have any hope when someone is rotten in the grave and their bones have, have disintegrated and there's no flesh? Is there hope that there can be life there? It's not Ezekiel is telling God that, God, you're asking me something difficult. You're asking me if they can live and they're disintegrated. I mean, this is not humanly possible. Only God can do this. And that's why when the disciples ask the Lord, then, then who can be saved? This is with, and then Christ tells them, you know, with man, this is impossible, but not with God. Because how can a dead person have life again? We have life because God is powerful. And which is the emphasis here of the Apostle Paul. He says, and you who are dead in your trespasses, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with Christ. Look at that in verse number 12. He says, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you once were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. He's saying that the same way the all omnipotent God raised Christ from the dead on the third day, on that beautiful Sunday morning, when the tomb was empty, when the women reigned and the disciples reigned and they found the tomb empty. That powerful Sunday morning is the way our salvation is described. The same way Lazarus would come from the tomb is the same way we came out from the tomb, having been raised from the dead. It says that the God who powerfully raised Christ from the dead is the very God who raises us powerfully spiritually that we can have life. We who are dead in trespasses. 
raised powerfully by God to show that our God is omnipotent. He has tremendous power. Power to save those who are dead. Power to bring life where there is no life. Power to speak to Ezekiel and Ezekiel would see life coming and is surprised. He's the very God that saves us. He brings life unto us. We are raised by God sovereignly. It's a monogistic work. God alone does it. We don't cooperate with him. But again, raised powerfully. The same God that raised Christ from the dead is the same God that raises us from our lostness, our deadness in sin. Thirdly and lastly, raised with Christ. We are raised sovereignly, we are raised powerfully, and then thirdly we are raised with Christ Jesus. The Bible says, and you who are dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive, watch this, together with Christ, together. We are seeing the resurrection of Christ Jesus is the picture we are being drawn to. Watch this. Can you envision the way Christ was raised from the dead? It's the same way you should envision how you are raised from the dead. And not just the same way, but together with him. That means the raising of Christ Jesus from the dead is the reason we are alive. If Christ had not been risen from the dead or raised from the dead, all of us would be hopeless to date. <laughs> Why is the resurrection of Christ so glorious? Because it imparts life to us. Life is imparted unto us because of Christ. He gives life abundantly. How? And that's why he says, the Son of Man must be lifted up. He must die. When the Apostle Peter discourages him that you can't die, he tells him, I must die. And tells him, get behind me, Satan, because you don't know what you're saying. I must die so that I'm buried, that I'm raised from the dead. Because when I'm raised from the dead, you have life. We don't have life, spiritual life, apart from Christ being raised from the dead. <laughs> That's why we, we glory in this resurrection. We had life when he was raised from the dead. And so we have life because he was raised from the dead. We live spiritually because Christ is alive. Is the point here. That means that every other blessing that occasions the death, burial, and the resurrection of Christ Jesus is our blessing. We don't have any blessing outside of the scope of Christ Jesus, is the point. Is it life? We only have life because of Christ. There's nothing outside of the realm of Christ. We were partakers of his resurrection. I mean, who are we that God would consider us? We partakers of Christ Jesus' life. That he raises us from the, with the same power that brought Christ back to life. That we have the same life that Christ has, has, you know, has, having been raised from the dead. Does this not invoke joy in your hearts? Does this not make you feel like, I want to know this God. I want to know that Savior. The Apostle Paul they, then would say, I want to know that man, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the power of his resurrection. That's what I want to know. How powerfully was he raised? Because it is through that powerful raising of the Son of God on the third day that the Apostle Paul says, I have life. Having been justified, not because of his own works, having been given righteousness that this man, the God-man Christ Jesus, then would bring to humanity. That is our hope. And that's why the Apostle Paul says, Therefore, as you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, just as you are taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Let's pray. Precious Lord, it's so marvelous that uh, we have life, life that uh, you have brought forth through the resurrection of your son, our savior. Men and women and children who were once dead in their trespasses, out of the richness of your mercy and great love, you've put us, Lord, in our wretched condition, and you've made us alive. You've raised our old 
natures now, we no longer have them. You've given us new natures. We have new life in Christ Jesus. What a joy we have in you, Lord, that you would cause our hearts to be joyous for what you have done for us in the work and in the person of your Son, our soon-coming Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.